Hello, everybody, and welcome into Senior Living Live. My name is Melissa. Thank you so much, as always, for joining us. And of course, Happy New Year. Today, we are discussing ways to guide parents towards joyful golden years. Sometimes, of course, that is easier said than done. Today, Jean Hartnett is our guest presenter, and she has got some wonderful tips to share with you over the course of this webinar to help your parents out on that end. Of course, we want you all to be a part of the conversation, and in order to do that, you can drop a question into the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A. Just type your questions there, and I will be happy to read all of those to Jean at the end of her webinar, which we expect to last between 45 minutes and an hour. So. Go ahead and settle in. Jean, thank you so much for being with us here today. The webinar is all yours. Hello, Melissa. Thank you so much. And yes. thank you to all of you that are joining with us live and those of you who will be watching this later. My name is Jean Hartnett, and I come from the long-term care field. I actually have been in the long-term care field since 1989, when I started out as a certified nursing assistant in my town's um, most famous rehabilitation hospital called Madonna Rehabilitation Hospital in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, I'm going to be sharing with you my journey from geriatrics to pediatrics and then back to geriatrics through the lens of trauma-informed care. I'm so excited to share this information with you because this notion of trauma-informed care is one that's making its way to senior living. And it's incredible, valuable information for individuals that are either considering moving into assisted living or nursing home environments, for family caregivers that take care of family members and older adults, but also for operators and owners of these organizations. It is my goal to sh share the fire that I have in my belly for this very important topic called trauma-informed care. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Make sure I select the correct. Okay. So as I said, I am Jean Hartnett. Um, I am going to be with you for the next hour really talking about ways in which you can guide your parents or the older adult that you care for to golden years. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a long journey in order to get there in terms of really understanding the true uh, picture of older adults' mental wellness. So today we're going to learn about the common types of childhood adversity through a discussion of a study called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. You're going to learn about this study as well as learn about prevalence of trauma in our society. Participants on this webinar will also learn how a history of trauma impacts a person's mental and physical health, as well as understand how to implement a trauma-informed approach in your family or in your assisted living or nursing home community. Finally, I'm going to provide you with vast resources so that you can learn more about this topic, because I can almost guarantee that you will want to learn more once we go through this webinar. So as I mentioned, I am going to talk a little bit about my journey from geriatrics to pediatrics and back again to geriatrics. I came to the long-term care profession in 1989 when I was 19 years old. And I was a certified nursing assistant, again, at one of Lincoln, Nebraska's most premier rehabilitation hospitals. This particular hospital was divided up into a number of different programs. And the program that I worked in was the skilled nursing facility program. And it was here, ladies and gentlemen, where I literally fell in love with the caretaking of older adults. So the bathing, the dressing, the toileting, the transferring, you know, all of those unsavory tasks that we think about when we think about taking care of an older adult, I literally fell in love with. And it was this early work that inspired me decades later to go back and study this um, and get my master's in health services administration with a specialty in long-term care. 
And with that education and the experience that I had when I was 19 years old, I then began to manage and lead some of Nebraska's and some of our nation's largest nursing home facilities. And it was here again where my love for geriatrics really permeated my management style. But as some of my provider friends who may be on this webinar can attest, at times we in nursing home administration become burnt out. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, so I took a break from long-term care and went to a pediatric hospital where I managed the social work and case management departments. And it was here where I started to learn about trauma. And the first opportunity for me to learn about trauma actually happened in a nursing home environment. So all of you may be familiar with the different levels of care that we provide older adults in our, in our country. So my expertise really was in the skilled nursing environment. So those um, organizations that receive Medicare and Medicaid payment in order to operate. And because nursing homes receive that type of reimbursement that comes from the government, we are heavily regulated for, by an organization called the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And one of the things that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services were requiring of skilled nursing facilities is that we become trauma-informed. And specifically, the language of the regulation and the language of the legislation is displayed for you here on this slide, and I'll read it to you. So when I was in charge, I had to ensure that residents who are trauma survivors receive culturally competent trauma-informed care in accordance with professional standards and practice and accounting for a resident's experiences and preferences in order to eliminate or mitigate against triggers that may cause re-traumatization of the resident. Now, even just reading that, that is a mouthful. So you can imagine me about seven or eight years ago, looking at the language of this regulation and saying to myself, I don't have a clue what this means. I don't know how to implement this. I mean, everything else that the CMS would hand me, whether it was infection control or fall prevention programs or making sure that bloodborne pathogens were um, managed okay and, and by clinical standards. But this particular uh, regulation really had me flummoxed. So I had a call with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and I talked to about three nurse consultants that work there. And I was asking them, you know, what is it that you're looking for in this legislation and in this regulation? And they told me, ladies and gentlemen, that the reason why they have this regulation is that up to 90% of the older adults that I was caring for likely had a traumatic event in their lifetime. And that approximately 70 to 90% of those age 65 and older, so even younger, may have been exposed to something that could potentially have been traumatic. So either 90% had it, or at least 70 to 90% potentially could have trauma in their life. They went on to say that the second highest rate of death by suicide occurred in adults 85 and older. And I was really impacted by this conversation with the nurse consultants because again, if this was occurring in my nursing home, if I could extrapolate those statistics to the people that I loved and I cared for, well, then there was a lot of work that I had to do. And one of the things that occurred to me as I was implementing this regulation in my nursing home is I called upon a quote that one of my best friends here in the neighborhood, her name is Helga, she's a woman that I've known for about 10 years, told me that she was a Holocaust survivor. And Helga didn't tell me this information until about eight years into our relationship. She finally told me that her childhood experience was that of being born in Eastern Europe and immigrating to the United States after, world, after the World War. And she told me that her father and some of her siblings had perished in, in the Holocaust. And she said to me, Jean, I was such a small girl that I didn't get a tattoo, but I still have the scars. 
And I think that's the way we ought to think about trauma, whether we're talking about the older adult in our lives, or we're talking about our neighbor, we're talking about our siblings or our companions. It's really understanding that you may not know what happened in their lives, but they likely have scars and you likely do too. So what is trauma exactly? So this um, definition comes from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, also knows that, known as SAMHSA. So individual trauma results from an event, a serious event, or a set of circumstances that are experienced by an individual that may be emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that have lasting effects on the individual's functioning as well as their mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. So such things that we can think of that could be traumatic include natural disasters, war and terrorism, accidents, community violence, child abuse and child neglect, car accidents, witnessing domestic violence, et cetera. All of those things we can hear commonly say that those likely are traumatic events. But it wasn't until 1998 when the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and Kaiser Permanente decided to study 17,300 individuals to really understand if there are categories that we can lump childhood adversity into to then understand how that childhood adversity affects how we grow into adults and later how we age. So this study, which is known as the Landmark ACEs study, ACEs study or Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, again, studied 17,300 individuals. Half of the individuals were participants were men, half of the uh, participants were female. And what they discovered in these mostly white college education, college educated individuals is that their chronicities, whether it be diabetes, heart disease, COPD, or behaviors such as mental illness or addictions to drug and alcohol actually were tied to 10 categories of childhood adversity. What the Centers for, uh, what the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Kaiser Permanente found is that these 10 categories child physical abuse, child sexual abuse, child emotional abuse, physical and emotional neglect, mental illness, depression, and having someone who's suicidal in your home, as well as having a drug addicted or alcohol fam alcoholic family member, witnessing domestic violence against your mother or losing a parent to divorce or having someone in your family that's incarcerated. These are the hallmark 10 categories of childhood adversity that were studied in these 17,300 individuals. And what the two physicians that um, studied this phenomena in these individuals discovered is that the abuse that they had suffered and the loss of parents that, that they had suffered and just how many individuals, young women that were then older women had been afflicted with physical or sexual abuse were numbers that were extraordinary. So much so that they knew that those things that happened to them as children were directly impacting the way that they were matriculating into adulthood. So again, having these um, 10 categories, any number of them is going to impact um, how we age and how we matriculate into adulthood. So here's just another way to look at um, what these adversities and how they're category, how they're categor, how they're categorized. So again, the abuse is physical, emotional, or sexual. Neglect is physical and emotional. And then what we know is household dysfunction: someone with a mental illness, an incarcerated relative, someone who is substance dependent, having divorce in your family, or seeing your mother um, that is treated violently. What the key um, study found or what the ACEs study found is that there is a direct link between childhood trauma and the adult onset of chronic disease, as well as mental illness. About two thirds of the participants experienced at least one or more types of adversity in childhood. And of those, 87% had experienced two or more types. 
In other words, ACEs doesn't happen in isolation, meaning if you have one, you likely have two. If you have two, you could have three or four because it kind of all um, molds together, if you will. Also, what they discovered is that there's a dose dependency to these outcomes, meaning the more ACEs an individual have, the higher the risk for medical, mental, social, and economic problems. Here's another look, tying it back to helping your older adult in your life move towards joyful aging. The tie-in here is that in order to help the older adult in your life have that, we do have to go back to the experiences they may have um, experienced during childhood. Individuals that have an ACEs of four or more are 10 times as likely to use injectable drugs, seven times more likely to be alcoholic, three times more likely to engage in risky behaviors, risky sexual behaviors, three times more likely to binge drink, two times more likely to be a current smoker, 30 times more likely to attempt suicide, five times more likely to suffer from depression, and 11 times more likely to be diagnosed with dementia. So one of the things that I like to show to the audience that, that I present to is this picture of an iceberg, because I really think that it depicts just exactly what we're going for when we are becoming ACEs aware. You know, the older adults in our lives, especially this particular generation, really is that generation who really did pick themselves up by their bootstraps. And they also didn't really talk about things that were private and things that could be considered shameful or bring dishonor to the family. So that red arrow there really points to what we think we know about our older adult. That blue arrow next is what some people might know, say a spouse or a close friend may know this older adult's history and, and their true history of childhood adversity. What we really should know though, is what lies beneath the water. Um, those things that may have happened to an older adult that we aren't quite sure of, but their behaviors, whether that be addictive to drugs and alcohol or prone to anger or prone to depression, these are the really, really the things we ought to know, but sometimes never will. So I wanna show you next a video clip and this video clip lasts about five minutes, but it's very compelling. And it basically shows us what it would be like if we had more individuals like this resident that's going to be talking about her history growing up during the Holocaust. I was born in 1934, one of a pair of twins. Miriam and I were the third and fourth children in the family. We lived in a very small village in Transylvania, Romania. We got down from the cattle car. People were selected to live or to die. People crying, pushing, shoving, dogs barking, trying to make some sense of that place. And I actually turned around in trying to figure out what is that place. Never seen a place like that before. And as I turned around, I realized that my father and my two older sisters were gone. Never saw them again. We were holding on to mother for dear life. And Nazi was running in the middle of that selection platform yelling in German, twins, twins. He noticed us and demanded to know if we were twins. And my mother asked, is that good? And the Nazi said, yes. My mother said, yes. At that moment, another Nazi came, pulled my mother to the right. We were pulled to the left. We were crying, she was crying. And all I ever remember is seeing my mother's arms stretched out in despair as she was pulled away. I never even said goodbye to her, but I did not understand that this would be the last time that we would see her. And all that took 30 minutes from the time we got down from the cattle car 
and my whole family was gone, only Miriam and I were left holding hands and crying. We were Mengele twins, which we found out later on what that meant. Mengele would count us every morning, and he wanted to know how many guinea pigs he had this day. I was used in two types of experiments. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, they would put me naked in a room with my twin sister and many other twins up to eight hours a day. They would measure every part of my body, compare it to my twin sister, and then compare it to chart. On alternate days, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, they would take us to a blood lab. They would tie both of my arms to restrict the blood flow, take a lot of blood from my left arm, and give me a minimum of five injections in the right arm. The content of those injections, we didn't know then, nor do we know today. I was you can imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the impact of Ava's early childhood experiences. And because of her courage and because she likely is an individual who wants her history recorded of the childhood adversity that she experienced uh, as a Mangala twin, it's really important for us to know those stories, for us who are providing the care and I will tell you that this really um, translated to me as I was taking care of my own parents. This is my mom and my dad towards the end of their life. In fact, both of these pictures are taken um, about three days before dad passed away and about two days before my mother passed away. They passed away in 2021. And because I was the caregiver of the family, I moved home with them and took care of them until they passed away. As you can see, Dad, even though it's a it'll, it's a little picture, he is in his chair with his glasses on. We just had our med pass, and we also had some yummy food. He's watching the Notre Dame game, and he is literally running the farm from his chair. That is the way that Dad kind of lived his life up until three days that he passed away. My mom, on the other hand, um, who is a very social person and someone who is always active, um, she didn't come to death as readily as my father did and wasn't at peace uh, even towards the end of life when it was very clear that um, she wasn't going to be with us very long, very much longer. And I can tell you that when I was a caregiver in the nursing home and even as an administrator, I was very involved in the end of life process with the residents that I cared for on the front line, but then that I also had living in my assisted living or nursing home. It's just something that, that I wasn't afraid of and that I really liked. And I wasn't afraid of it with my parents either. But at the time that I was taking care of my parents was the same time that I was becoming aware of ACEs of the adverse childhood experiences that occur in older adults, older adult lives. And I started applying those um, ACEs scores to my parents. And my dad probably has an ACEs score of two, where my mother probably has an ACEs score of seven. So as mom and dad were passing away, my dad passed away first, and people would say to me, you know, may your father rest in peace. May he rest in peace. We hope your dad rests in peace. I heard it all the time. And I started thinking to myself as I was doing my daily medica meditation, and I thought to myself, why is it that we say rest in peace? And I came to the conclusion that we say rest in peace because so few do. So... I'm here um, starting a movement, ensuring that all of us um, in our lives that we care for for older adults have an opportunity to allow for that older adult to truly rest in peace. And the way to do that is to uncover and become super curious 
about the adverse childhood experiences that your parents or the older adult in your life may have experienced. I'm gonna move on a little bit and talk about the biological effects of trauma. One of the best books I have ever read um, on my journey of becoming uh, trauma-informed is a book called The Body Keeps the Score. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I didn't pick this book up because I was on a trauma healing uh, journey myself or I wanted to understand it for my residents. I picked it up because that was a really interesting cover. So I'm a person who does judge a book by its cover. And I found this book really intriguing by its cover. And once I started picking it up and reading it, I was mesmerized by the information that was contained in. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk is a physician who studies trauma in individuals. And he teaches us that trauma is much more than a story about something that happened long ago. The emotions and physical sensations that were imprinted during the, tra during the traumatic event are experienced not as memories, but as disruptive physical reactions to the present. Traumatic experiences, whether it's sexual assault or incest or emotional and physical abuse, become embedded in our older, more primal parts of our brain that don't have access to conscious awareness. This is what's known as the reptilian brain. As a result of that experience being lodged in our reptilian part of our brain, two, thing ha two things happen. Trauma lodges in the body and we carry, carry a physical imprint of our psychic wounds and the mind hides the score from us. It obscures the memories or convinces us our victimization was our fault or covers the event in a shame so thick we don't discuss it. And this is direct quotes from the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And what it's telling us here, ladies and gentlemen, is that when a traumatic event happens, particularly in childhood, because we don't have um, the brain that is fully developed as an adult, we take that trauma in and it, it's wired in our central nervous system as a wound. And trauma in grief is wound. And if we don't have the ability to understand exactly why this trauma is happening or how to talk about it because we feel like the victimization that we're experiencing is our own fault, then that is when it starts living in our bodies and our fascia and our tissue. And that is how it matriculates into chronic disease and other addictions and mental behaviors. So when you see people that have what is known as the flight, fight, freeze response, typically we can think about these as someone who has an overactivated central nervous system where whatever happens, whether it's the backfiring of a car and a Vietnam veteran believes that they're back in Saigon fighting um, the Vietnamese. And what, what's happening in that moment is that person is transported back to that memory because the body is waking his conscious up to it. Um, but again, that trigger only triggers the reptilian brain, the brain that doesn't have um, access to rational thought. And post-traumatic stress disorder is, is exactly that. And it can happen to anyone. You don't have to be just a Vietnam veteran to experience it. So the challenge here is really looking at these behaviors that you see in people, if they're withdrawing, if they're acting out, or if they're refusing to answer your questions, not seeing those as someone who's being rude or someone who's being weird, but seeing it as a fight, flight, freeze um, response. One of the things that's so interesting about trauma is that some events in our lives are traumatic events, but they aren't experienced as a traumatic event. And one of the best examples I have for you is that when we were attacked in 20, 2001 on September 11th, um, the Twin Towers going down and the plane that was hijacked in Pennsylvania and also um, the attack on the Pentagon, that was a traumatic event because it was an act of war. Yet we in America really um, bonded together during that time. And until the anniversaries of 9-11 come around, I'm certain that many of us don't think about these events on a daily basis. 
And the reason for that is that events like 9-11 are experienced in community. And we're all experiencing the same thing at the same time. And that really can um, generate a rallying cry or organization around doing quilts for firefighters or doing bake sales for people who um, could have had family members that were victims of 9-11. It really rallies us against a cause. But when trauma happens in isolation, what happens is that we blame ourselves for that victimization. We start believing that um, it's not happening, but when that doesn't work any longer, we believe that it's, it's happening because it's our fault. And that's why trauma can be so impactful to our mental and physical health. So becoming trauma-informed really is about four different steps. So this is step one um, for all of you that attended the webinar today, is that you're really starting to realize or becoming familiar with the idea that trauma is widespread. We also need to move on to number two and recognize the signs and symptoms of, tra of trauma in our family members or our employees or our neighbors or our spouses in order to really understand the full person. In addition, we have to respond to what we're seeing. We have to integrate the knowledge that we're learning about trauma into the way that we treat one another. And finally, once we know that trauma exists in an individual, we have to avoid and resist re-traumatization. So putting uh, a Vietnam veteran, for example, at a display uh, for 4th of July fireworks, that is not going to help that person resist re-traumatization. In fact, it's probably going to re-traumatize them. So becoming trauma-informed really switches the narrative to what is wrong with you to what happened to you. And so much of this, I have to tell you, in my trauma-informed journey, um, in not only the work that I do with seniors, but in my own life, I really have switched my lens from what is wrong with this person that I don't really like to truly understanding what happened to them. And it opens up this whole um, field, if you will, of having compassion for the individuals that I used to really think kind of annoyed me. And I literally have changed the way that I think about the world and the way that I see people. Some of the things that might be important to do is really shifting your language when you become trauma informed. Instead of thinking that a person is exhibiting that they're sick, we have to understand that this person is a survivor. Instead of saying that a person is weak because of their trauma, we could say they're stronger for having gone through it. Instead of saying they should be over it already, we also can say recovery from trauma is a process and takes, takes time and so on and so forth. And these may seem like subtle shifts in language, but they're really important because the things that we speak also impact the way that we behave towards an individual that is a victim or a survivor of trauma. So one of the things that I do in my work is not only do I work with families and residents in assisted livings and nursing homes, but I also work with frontline team members. Remember, I was that frontline team member in 1989 who literally relished in the work that I did with older adults. But I also had some difficulties providing that care because there was so much um, emotional weight that I, as a 19-year-old person, was taking home with me after caregiving. And as I matriculated into leadership positions, I really started to understand that the individuals working on the front line of care and individuals that are family caregivers really are holding a lot of emotional weight when they're in that role. So what SAMHSA tells us is that whether or not someone has a history of trauma, bearing witness to human suffering and adversity can be deeply impactful. Reactivity related to unresolved trauma among workers and those they serve can make working conditions more difficult and can undermine health and safety. So we in the senior care profession have to provide effective and sensitive care to survivors of trauma, and that requires emotionally healthy and a competent and well-supported workforce. 
One of the uh, definitions that I came up with in my own work as I was thinking about what it meant to be a caregiver as I was caring for my parents and really unwinding our family trauma is I had to write down a definition of what I thought a caregiver reimagined could look like. So what I came up with is this definition and I wanna share it with you. It says that a trauma-informed caregiver is someone who can tolerate someone else's distress and stay in that distress while holding space for it. A trauma-informed caregiver knows when they need to take a break and will it, when it feels safe to come back to caregiving. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that it was awfully hard providing care for my parents as they were passing away, as our family dynamics and our family history and our past family trauma was all coming to the fore because our matriarch and patriarch were passing away. And so I had to carve out space to not only continue on my own trauma healing journey, but then also under, understand where my brothers and sisters were at in their grief, um, anticipatory grief, but also um, allow myself time and space to take a break from caregiving and come back to it when I had refueled my tank. One of the things I mentioned that becoming trauma-informed does is it allows us um, to embrace compassion. And I wanna share with you another video that I just love. And like the first video, this one is deeply impactful. You see, trauma-informed care is not just a phenomena for older adults and for the individuals that I worked with at Children's Hospital. It's also about all other systems that may impact trauma. So I want to share with you this project called the Compassion Prisoner Project that is occurring in California today, where individuals that are incarcerated are getting in touch with their adversities and understanding that their, their life of crime could be connected to the adversities they experienced as children. So without further ado... trauma circle. Is everyone ready to face their past with compassion? Is that a yes? yes? While you were growing up during your first 18 years of life, if a parent or other adult in the household often or very often would swear at you, insult you, put you down or humiliate you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often pushed, grabbed, slapped, or threw something at you, step inside the circle. If a parent or other adult in the household often or very often ever hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured, step inside the circle. If you often felt that no one in your family loved you or thought you were important or special, step inside the circle. If your family lived in extreme poverty, step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle. Step inside the circle.
you can imagine if, gosh, if you did a step inside the circle exercise in any community that you're involved in, whether it's your work community or your church community or the clubs that you belong to, what Fritzi Hortzman, the woman that was in the middle of the circle with the microphone was doing is she was calling out the 10 questions that are the adverse childhood experience questions. And as you can see, those individuals that are incarcerated, the overwhelming majority of them have had uh, a history of trauma. So applying the lens of trauma-informed care really replaces judgment with curiosity. So it allows for that first blush of understanding. If you're brave enough to step inside the circle and really admit to uh, the adversity that happened to you, then I'm going to get more curious about why it is that you ended up incarcerated. Embracing uh, trauma-informed care really engenders an environment of safety, trustworthiness, it allows for choice, and that means authentic choice instead of feeling like we have to be all things for all people. It embraces the notion of collaboration and empowerment. So one of the things that I want to shift to now is really understanding how to support the older adult in your life. Um, oftentimes when we're moving our parents into assisted living in a nursing home environment or we're caring for them at home, we really don't understand why they're behaving in the way that they're behaving. So we see that their coping mechanisms that they have adopted um, could be a result of their trauma. Those maladaptive behaviors that they have. So for my father, it was eating a lot of sweets. And for my mother, it was not eating at all. Those maladaptive behaviors were actually adaptive behaviors so that they could cope with the childhood adversity and the stress that they were experiencing. And I think so many times when we move our older adult or our loved one into assisted living or a nursing home, the reason why they don't want to go is that they know that those natural coping mechanisms won't be there for them any longer. Most facilities are smoke-free, so you, if you have an individual who copes through smoking, that probably won't be available to them. Not all communities allow for pets, so that beloved dog that was um, also a coping mechanism for your parent or older adult may not be available. Also, you have to eat on a schedule, and oftentimes you're eating in these really elaborate dining environments that just don't feel comfortable for you, so it, particularly if you grew up a food, in a food insecure environment as a child. So one of the things that I think is striking about the literature around loneliness um, and trauma is really, is really demonstrated in this graph here. As you can see, um, this is basically defining for us how Americans spend their time as they age. And you'll see once you hit probably in your 60s that time that you spend alone really crescendos to where you're no longer with people. And at times when that happens, when people are alone, is that time when that life review starts and that knowing of the childhood adversity that we experience starts to creep up, meaning you start really thinking about the life that you've lived because you know that your life is coming to an end in some situations. And I mean that very sensitively. So this life review really can trigger some of these behaviors that we see in older adults that live in our communities. One way to uh, mitigate against that is to get um, our older adults in our lives into trauma healing techniques without letting them know that that's what they're doing. Again, we're working with a generation here that really wants to keep their private world private, and we need to honor that. But there are programs and things that we can do in our nursing homes that really encourage the, the trauma treatment modalities that I've studied. One of those things is, is chair yoga, along with breathing exercises. Um, there's a group that I like to call Bitch and Stitch, where um, older adults are stitching and, and working with their hands and really talking about some of the memories that happened to them. And also having honest and open conversations with adult children and conversations that start 
we're noticing this about your mother or we're noticing this about your father and really getting curious as to why those behaviors are happening. I had an experience like this with one of the residents that I took care of. And in the interest of time, I will just tell you that this woman moved into my assisted living community, super healthy and really no problems medically whatsoever. And over time, this particular resident in a three month period lost 15 pounds. And we really worked with the parent or pardon me, with the adult children of this parent to understand just exactly what might be happening in the mother's life that would cause this weight loss. And it wasn't the food that we were serving and it wasn't necessarily um, having a meal because she did like to eat. It was a fact again that we were serving it in this dining room that where she didn't feel comfortable eating in front of people. So when you're trauma informed, you just keep asking the question and becoming curious as to why these things are happening with an older adult. One of the best things that I discovered in my journey of taking care of my parents, but also my journey in becoming a trauma informed consultant is this book called The Essential Questions. This book, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the best things I have read in the last five years, along with The Body Keeps the Score. I encourage all of you to pick it up as it really will invite conversations with your family members about what it was like to be them um, as, as when they were young and as they age. The final thing, one of the final things I wanna leave you with is really being able to define boundaries as you are going on your own trauma healing journey understanding trauma more, but then also trying to help the older adult in your life reconcile their childhood adversity. And one of the things that I was a terrible person of, of trying to understand is defining boundaries when I was caring for mom and dad. I happened upon this definition, which is the, the definition of a boundary is the distance at which I can love you and me simultaneously. And I just think that's such a beautiful depiction of what a boundary is. I'm going to leave uh, the deck, uh, the slide deck open for individuals to review at other times. But I just want to click through to the end here um, and really encourage people to start their own trauma healing, healing journey. And I know that it's difficult and I know that it's scary at some times. But one of the best musicians that I used to listen to, Leonard Cohen, tells us that there's a crack in everything. And thank God for that, because that's how the light gets in. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and open it up to questions that you might have. Excellent job, Jean. Very, very um, uh, well put together. Um, we love uh, numbers that go with facts. So thank you for producing that. Um, we've got a couple of questions here, but uh, this is a really good time for all of our viewers and all of you watching to get in your questions for Jean in case you have um, anything that popped up or you, you really weren't sure about throughout her presentation. Uh, again, you can go to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to type your question out there and we will get to those. Uh, we're going to be here until the top of the hour. So we've got about 11 minutes remaining. Um, one question I had is, as you were talking, so say you are a, uh, a child, uh, well, not a child anymore, but you're an adult child of a parent who um, may need to, uh, because, you know, maybe their health is deteriorating and they need to go to assisted living. And, and you know, as that child, that your parent has had some trauma and you know what that trauma is, but you've also known throughout the years that that's not something we touch. You know, this is not a trauma, you know about it, you're informed of it. How does someone um, deal with that? How do they, how do they approach that when they know what the trauma is, but they also know the parent wants nothing to do with it? That's such a great question, Melissa. And probably one that almost hits the level of an ethics discussion. And, and, I, and I mean that because I do feel like it is incumbent upon us as adult children to tell our parents' story and from the child's perspective, and but do it in a way that's loving 
and that still honors their personhood. I think we do a disservice to assisted living communities and nursing homes when we don't share um, what we know and what kind of is the best practice of when I when when you would have, have cared for your older adult. So really saying, this has been my experience. I'm the adult child, and this may help all of the other caregivers in this environment and in this institution to, 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 to care for them as well. Got it. Okay, great. I'm sure there are quite a few people out there um, who, again, uh, are in that sort of place, you know, at this time where um, it's like, what what do I do? And am I okay to share that? Because I know mom or dad doesn't want to talk about it. And so, you know, as you said, it's sort of walking that fine line, but at the end, it's whatever really is going to help that parent thrive moving forward. Um, Rosemary has a question here. Uh, my husband is currently in a nursing home. I spend a lot of time there and I volunteer as well. I've grown to love the seniors and want to have a career within this industry. What kinds of roles are there that deal with engaging with seniors outside of being a CNA? And does one need to have a, have a certification to uh, contribute? Uh, this sounds like a good question for you. Well, thank you. Gosh, Rosemary, that sounds like an exciting new chapter of your life. So there are many roles in assisted living and nursing homes that you can take on that isn't the direct caregiving. One that comes to mind automatically is an activities coordinator. So someone that is really thinking of those creative ways to engage seniors. Um, there's also absolutely always, as I remember, shortages in dining services. And I know that doesn't sound like something that's exciting or necessarily sexy, if you will, but my goodness, if we can make good meals and have a nourishing environment in which people eat those meals, that is such an important role. Uh, being at the front desk, that was kind of the hub every time I was an administrator, that person that answers the phone and greets the guests. That's a beautiful way to contribute if you're interested in being around older adults and really bringing in some positivity into a community. Yeah, and on the back end of that, Rosemary, um, and I speak for Arbor specifically, so everybody, every every place will be a little different. But um, what Arbor does is they bring some people out outside of the community to share uh, their experience or knowledge and whatever it may be. It could be a book club. It could be knitting. It could be, you know, whatever hobby that you're pretty good at. It could bring somebody in to sort of teach other people how to do that same hobby. That could also be a natural way for you to sort of infiltrate and be a part of the community that your, your husband is a part of as well. So um, just sort of think of things that you're good at, things that you like, and how can you share that with others? So um, that's a great question. Uh, and Melissa, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll interject, you know, do you remember there was a news story during COVID of a woman whose husband had dementia early stages and early onset. So early, early, and he was in a dementia care facility and because of COVID, she could not visit. So she got a job as a dietary aide and a cook. So she could see her husband every single day. Her name is escaping me right now, but she also does a lot of lectures and, and whatnot to the senior living um, profession. So I just want to mention that, that it's another way to show love, not only for your family member, but for the profession as well. I think I missed that story, but I'm, I'm thinking genius. You know, this woman is a genius uh, to, yeah. to come up with that as a solution. Um, and and it, it goes to what you were saying, you know, any way that you can, that you could contribute, um, those opportunities are certainly there for mm -hmm. sure. It takes a little bit of, of thinking and maneuvering to get that done. So, and yeah. Rosemary says, thank you for your response and the presentation. This was informative. Uh, so from Anonymous, you mentioned a book there, Jean. What is the name of the book and the author again? There's two books that, that I um, really encourage people to pick up. The first is called The Body Keeps the Score by Vessel van der Kolk. Vessel with a B. Um, that will teach you everything you want to know about trauma. Um, and it's written with the layperson in mind, even though it gets into some science and some kind of like um, medical information. It's, it's definitely one that I would have you pick up. 
The second one is called The Essential Questions by Elizabeth Keating. And that book is going to walk you through some of the most um, deep questions that you can ask your older adult in your life that's just going to open up all sorts of avenues on how that older adult um, grew up, a little bit about your grandparents. You know, just it's just a beautiful book that opens up those discussions. Awesome. Uh, we've got four minutes left until the top of the hour. Um, if anybody has any additional questions, this is a really good time to get those into the Q&A box. Jean, what about you? Um, if somebody's watching this on the back end and say it's midnight and it's a week from now and they see this link and they're really interested in this topic, how can they get in touch with you? What, what's a way that people can reach out to you if they have any additional questions? Oh, that's such a great question. Thank you, Melissa. So my company is called Radical Sabbatical. So you can go to www.radical-sabbatical.net and get in touch with me there. The reason why I call my business Radical Sabbatical is when I was caring for my parents, I was on sabbatical and I wanted to make it interesting. So I called it a radical sabbatical. And my company is all about helping individuals understand trauma and with that understanding, create a life they don't want to run away from. Awesome. I, I love that name. <laughs> I think that is um, uh, excellent. I, I just, um, you said it and I was like, man, that's snazzy. Very nice yeah. job. Uh, let's see. We got something that came in here at the last minute from Rosemary. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of the conversation there, Rosemary, today. How long uh, will this link be available for viewing? Well, that is good. I'm going to get to that here in just a few seconds as we wrap up this webinar. So sit tight. Um, Jean, anything else you want to share uh, with everybody here as, as we wrap up? And Rosemary, I'll get to your question here momentarily. You know, I guess I would leave people, Melissa, with this is a very difficult conversation to have. Yep. We don't want to think about the trauma that we could have experienced or gosh, the trauma that our parents could have experienced. But I will tell you that I'm a living example of a person who's confronting that and healing from it. And I am a changed individual because of it. And I would just encourage people to take a deep dive into these sensitive topics um, Brene Brown tells us that shame dies in the light. And so we've got to talk about the unsavory things that might have happened to us and how we experience them. Because so many of your neighbors, your friends, your family members are able to say that happened to me too. And that's how we kind of put to rest that our deep seated secrets are shameful. They're not. And so I think that's what I would leave your listeners with is that becoming trauma informed really does change your life, changes your family, changes your community. And that's why I am attempting to start a movement around it. Yeah, awesome. Now everyone watching can now be a trauma informed caregiver. Thanks to uh, your wonderful, wonderful words here today. And again, with all of the data to back it up, Jean, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Melissa. Now, for those of you watching, and uh, you included Rosemary, uh, if you want to watch this webinar again, or you want to share it with friends and family, uh, I've got an excellent way for you to do that. Uh, this webinar will be sent in a link to the emails that you utilize to RSVP for this webinar starting tomorrow. So the link will be available um, there in your email. It will also be available on our website starting tomorrow, our website, www.seniorlivinglive.com. Dot com. While you're there, feel free to check out all of our other videos all about senior living. It's available 24-7 and it is free. Thank you so much for being a part of our conversation and for being a part of Senior Living Live. Have a great day, everybody.